I yell, part two, chapter one. Appropros of the wet snow. So this starts off with like a little, some sort of little poem. When from error's murky ways, I freed your fallen soul with burning words of exhortation when filled with profound torment. You wrung your hands and cursed all ensnaring vice when with memory punishing, your conscience so unmindful, you told me the tale of all that was before me. And suddenly, hiding your face, overcome with shame and horror, indignant and shaking, you tearfully resolved, etc., etc., etc. From the poetry of N.A. Nekrasov. At that time, I was more than 24 years old. Even then, my life was gloomy, chaotic, and wildly lonely. I didn't socialize with anyone. I even avoided conversations and withdrew further and further into my corner. At work in the office, I even tried not to look at anyone. I realized perfectly well that my colleagues not only regarded me as a crank, and this is how it always struck me, but seemed to look on me with the kind of loathing. I used to wonder, why does no one else but me get the impression he's looked upon with lo loathing? One of our office clerks had a repulsive, extremely pockmarked face, rather like a criminal's even. With such a repulsive face like that, I thought I would never have dared look at anyone. Another clerk had a uniform that was so tatty there was a nasty smell if you went near him. And yet neither of these two gentlemen was embarrassed, neither on account of his clothes, nor his face, nor on moral grounds, so to speak. Neither one of them imagined for one moment that he was being looked upon with loathing, and if they did imagine that, they didn't care one rap as long as their superiors didn't deign to look at them. It was abundantly clear to me that because of my unbounded vanity and the demands I made upon myself, I very often looked upon myself with furious dissatisfaction that amounted to disgust and consequently I mentally attributed my own attitude to everyone else. For example, I hated my face, I found it vile. I even suspected that it had a kind of base expression, so whenever I appeared at the office, I suffered agonies in attempting to behave as independently as possible to ensure that they didn't suspect me of baseness and give my face the most dignified expression possible. But what if my face is unsightly? I thought it doesn't matter as long as it has a noble, express, expressive, and above all, extremely intelligent look. But I knew without any doubt, I was painfully aware that my face could never express all these perfections, but what was worse than anything, I found it positively stupid. I would have been quite happy to settle for intelligence. I would even have been content with the base expression as long as my face struck people as awfully intelligent at the same time. Needless to say, I hated all the office clerks from first to last and despised them all, yet at the same time I was also somehow afraid of them. Sometimes it happened that I would even rate them as superior to myself. It was all very sudden. In one moment I would despise them and the next I'd rate them superior to myself. A cultured, self-respecting person cannot be vain without making unlimited demands on himself and without at other, other times despising himself to the point of hatred. Whether I despise them or class them as my superiors, practically at the, every encounter I would lower my eyes. Practically at every encounter I would I lower my eyes. I used, to, I used to make experience, I even used to make experiments to discover whether I could bear someone, wherever it might be, staring at me. I was invariably the first to look down. This tormenting me to distraction, also the fear of appearing ridiculous made me ill, so I slavishly followed routine and everything that had to do with outward appearances. Enthusiastically, I fell into the common rut and with my heart and soul feared the least sign of eccentricity in myself, but how was I to keep it up? I was painfully cultivated as any cultivated man of our time should be, but they were a dim-witted lot, each like the other as a flock of sheep. Perhaps I was the only clerk in the whole office who always looked upon myself as a coward and a slave. I, that's precisely why I felt I was cultivated. But not only did I appear to be an actual fact, I was a coward and a slave. I say that without the least embarrassment. Every self-respecting man of our time and is bound to be a coward and a slave. That's his normal condition. Of that, I am deeply convinced. That's how he's fashioned. That's what he's created for. And it is not simply in our time as a consequence of certain random events, but it's generally true at all times that any self-respecting man is bound to be a coward and a slave. This is a law of nature that applies to every decent person in this world. Even if one of them happens to put on a show of bravery over something, he shouldn't take any comfort from it or get it carried away. He'll still make a fool of himself in front of others. This is the only and an eternal outcome. Only asses and crossbreeds try to appear brave, and even then, to a certain extent. But it's not worth paying attention to them, since they don't matter one little bit. At that time, one other thing tormented me, to be precise. No one was like me, nor was I like anyone else. 
I'm one person and they are everybody, I thought, becoming your, becoming very pensive. From all this, it is obvious that I was still a complete child. At times, completely contradictory things happened. Occasionally, going to the office utterly repelled me. Things reached the point where many times I went home feeling quite ill. And suddenly, out of the blue, a bout of skepticism and indifference would set in. Everything with me was in bouts, and then I would laugh at my own intolerance and squeamishness and reproach myself with romanticism. I did not want to talk to anyone, but now I would go so far as to start a conversation with people and even consider striking up friendships with them. Suddenly, for no obvious reason, my fastidiousness would vanish at one stroke. Who knows, perhaps it had never even existed in me. It was only assumed and borrowed from books. To this day, I haven't solved this question. Once I even became great friends with them, started visiting their homes, playing preference, drinking vodka, and discussing promotion. But please allow me to digress a little here. Generally speaking, we Russians have never had in our ranks those stupid, starry-eyed romantics of the German variety, especially the French type who don't turn a, turn a hair at anything. Even if the ground were to open up beneath them, even if the whole of France were perishing at the barricades, they would still stay the same. They would not change, not even out of common decency, but would carry on singing their transcendental songs to their dying day, so to speak, because they are fools. But here on Russian soil, we have no fools. That's a well-known fact. That's why we differ from other Germanic countries. Consequently, transcendental and nature is not to be found among us in the pure form. It was our positive publicists and critics of those days in pursuit of Constant Golos and Uncle Piotr Ivanoviches stupidly talking them as stupidly taking them as their ideal, invented all that stuff about our romantics, considering them just as worldly, otherworldly as in France or Germany. On the contrary, the characteristics of our romantics are the complete and diametrical opposite of the trans Dental, transcendental European variety, not one European criterion applies here. Permit me to use this word romantic. It is an ancient, venerable, time honored word and familiar to all. The characteristics of our romantic type are to see everything and often to see it incomparably more clearly than our finest intellects, not to be reconciled with anyone or anything, but at the same time, not to balk at it and always evading difficulties, deferring to everyone and having tactfully to everyone and behaving tactfully to everyone, never losing sight of useful practical goals, such as rent-free apartments, nice little pensions or medals, <clears throat> never forgetting those aims for all these enthusiasms and dainty volumes of lyrical verse, while at the same time preserving and violate in himself to his dying day the sublime and beautiful and appropriately preserving himself completely cocooned in cotton wool, like some piece of jewelry ostensibly for the benefit of that very same sublime and beautiful our romantic is a man of broad vision and the most accomplished of all our swindlers i can assure you of that even from the personal experience of course all this only applies if the romantic is clever but what am i saying the romantic is always clever and i merely wish to point out that even if we may have had our romantic fools they don't count solely because when they were in their prime they were finally reborn as germans and to preserve their jewel more conveniently they settled somewhere over there, chiefly in Weimar or the Black Forest. I, for instance, genuinely despised my office job and it was only sheer necessity that prevented me from saying to hell with it, since all I did was sit there and get paid for it. Therefore, please know, I didn't say to hell with it. A romantic would sooner go insane, which is very rare, however, but he doesn't give a damn if he has no other job in mind and he'll never be thrown out on his, de on his neck, although he might be hauled off to the madhouse because he thinks he's the king of Spain. And it's only if he really has gone stark raving mad you see, only the anemic and fair-haired go out of their minds in Russia, but we have an incalculable number of romantics, and they subsequently attained exalted rank. <clears throat> Such astonishing versatility. In what capacity for the most contradictory sensations? Even at the time, these thoughts comforted me, and even now, I hold the same views. That's why we have so many broad natures who, even in their ultimate decline, never lose sight of their ideal. And though they may not lift a finger for that ideal, although they may be out, and out thieves and gangsters, they still respect their original ideal to the point of tears and are uncommonly pure of heart. Oh yes, sir, it's only with us that the most inveterate scoundrel can be utterly and even sublimely pure of heart without at the same time ceasing to be a scoundrel in any way. I repeat from among our romantics, such business-like rogues, I use the word rogue with affection, emerge pretty often and they suddenly display such a feeling for reality, such practical awareness, and that their astonished superiors and the public can only click their tongues at them in utter amazement. This versatility is truly staggering, and God only knows what it might turn into, how it will subsequently develop and what it holds in store for us in the future.
and the material isn't at all bad. I don't say this out of some sort of ridiculous or jingoistic patriotism. However, I'm convinced that again, you're thinking that I'm trying to be funny. Who knows, perhaps the opposite true. That is, you're convinced that that's what I really do think. At any rate, gentlemen, I shall consider either of your views as an honor and a particular pleasure, but please forgive this digression. Of course, I didn't keep up my friendship with my colleagues. Very soon, I fell out with them and only to my still youthful inexperience at the same time even stopped greeting them, giving them the cold shoulder, as it were. However, this happened to me only once in general. I was always alone. To begin with, at home, I spent most of my time reading. I wanted to stifle all that was continuously boiling up inside me through external expressions. But of all external impressions, reading was the only one possible for me. Or no, external impressions. Of course, reading helped a lot. It excited, delighted, and tormented me. By the time it bored me to death, for all that I still wanted to be doing things, and I would suddenly plunge into dark, subterranean vile, not so much depravity as petty dissipation. My mean, trivial lusts were keen and fiery as a result of my constant morbid irritability. The surges were hysterical, always accompanied by tears and convulsions. Apart from reading, I had nowhere to turn. I mean, there was nothing in my surroundings that I could respect then or to which I might have been attracted. Moreover, dreadful, moreover, dreadful ennui, E-N-N-U-I was seething within me. A historical craving for contradiction and contrast would make its presence felt, and so I launched into debauchery. I haven't just told you all this simply to excuse myself, not at all, but no. I've lied to justify that myself is exactly what I wanted. That's why I'm just making this trifling observation for my own benefit, gentlemen. I don't want to lie, I've given you my word. My debauchery was solitary, nocturnal, furtive, timorous, and sordid, and it was accompanied by a feeling of shame. That did not deserve me at the most depraved moments, at such times even culminating in curses. Even in those days I carried underground deep within me, I was terrified that I might somehow be seen or meet someone, be recognized. I frequented various extremely shady places. One night I was passing someone wretched. One night I was passing some wretched ta tavern. Through a brightly lit window I saw some gentlemen standing around a billiard table doing battles with their cues. Doing battle with their cues and then one of their company was thrown out of the window. Any other time this would have positively sickened me, but I envied the ejected gentleman so much that I even walked straight into the billet room. Perhaps I told myself, I'll get into a fight and I'll be thrown out of the window too. I wasn't drunk, but what should I do? To what state of hysteria, what state of hysteria depression can sometimes reduce one, but nothing came of it. As things turned out, I was even incapable of jumping out of the window and I finally made my exit without having a fight. From the start, I was confronted by an officer. I was standing by the billiard table, inadvertently blocking the way of this officer who wanted to get past. He took me by the shoulders in complete silence, and without a word of warning or explanation, shifted me from where I was standing to another place, and I walked on as if he hadn't even seen me. I would have forgiven him for beating me, but in no way could I forgive him for moving me from one place to the other and completely failing to notice me. The devil knows what I would have given then for a real, for a more correct quarrel, a more proper, a more literary one to say. They treated me like a fly. The officer was about six feet tall and I was short and emaciated. However, it was within my power to start a quarrel. All I needed to do was protest and of course I would have been thrown out of the window, but I reconsidered and preferred to withdraw from the scene with bitter feelings. I left the tavern confused and distressed, went straight home and the very next day I continued my petty debauchery even more timidly feeling more downtrodden and despondent than ever before and with tears in my eyes so it seemed before all that I preserved. Don't imagine, however, that I shied away from that officer through cowardice. Oh my god, I just spilled my weed. Sorry. I feel like this writer is actually talking about like something you can understand, you know? At some points you think he's out of his mind, but Oh, sorry, I had to draw my weed. You know what I'm saying? So, I don't know. Sometimes when I when I go over what I what I'm reading, I um I kind of look back at like I kind of think back to like um when I go over what I'm reading, I I feel like if I I hear things again for a second time. It's kind of like I can see it more when someone says it out loud, you know? They always say they prefer us to read because it's like, I don't know, but when it's said out loud, sometimes I don't really watch these videos, but um, 
So now it so so now it was not cowardice that made me withdraw, but unbounded vanity. I was not scared of the height of six feet, nor that I might be painfully beaten and thrown out of the window. True, I had sufficient physical courage, but I lacked moral courage. I was afraid that everyone there, from that smart alec of a marker to the last deceased, pimply, miserable, greasy college clerk, would fail to understand and would ridicule me when I made my protest and addressed him in literary language. Because to this day, it's impossible for us to discuss a point of honor. I don't actually mean honor, but point of honor, point de honneur. In anything but literary language, in ordinary in ordinary language, points of honor are never mentioned. I was perfectly convinced this instinct for reality, despite all my romanticism, that all of them would simply die laughing, and that the other, and that the officer wouldn't simply, that is, inoffensively, have laid into me, but would certainly have shoved me with his knee all around the billiard table, and only then would have he taken pity and thrown me out of the window. Of course, I couldn't allow this wretched episode to end just like that. Afterwards, I often met the officer in the street and I observed him very closely. Only I can't say whether he recognized me. Most, prob most probably not. Certain indications led me to this conclusion. But as for me, I looked at him with anger and loathing and so it went on for several years. My anger grew and strengthened as the, as the years passed. At first, I started making discreet inquiries about this officer. This I found most difficult as I didn't know so. But once someone hailed him in the street when I was following at a short distance as if I were on a lead, and so I discovered his surname. Another time I followed him right up to his flat and for 10 kopecks learned from the caretaker where he lived on which floor, whether on his own or with someone, etc. In short, everything that could be learned from a caretaker. One morning, although I had never engaged in literary activities a sunny I suddenly hit on the idea of denouncing that officer by caricaturing him in a short story. I took great delight in writing that story. I exposed him. I even, I even libeled him. At first, I disguised his name in such a way that it was instantly recognizable. But later, on mature reflection, I changed it and sent it off to Fatherland Notes. But in those days, there was still no denunciar denunciatory literature and my story wasn't published. This I found deeply annoying. At times, I simply choked with anger. Finally, I decided to challenge my enemy to a duel. I composed a beautiful, charming letter, begging him to apologize. In the event of a refusal, I hinted at a duel in fairly strong terms. The letter was written in such a way that if the officer had had the least inkling of the sublime and beautiful, then no doubt he would have come running to me to throw his arms around my neck and offer me his friendship. Oh, how wonderful that would have been. What a life we would have spent together. What a life. Would have protected me with his exalted rank, I would have ennobled him with my culture and well, with my ideas, all kinds of things, so many would have been possible. But just imagine, two years had passed since he first insulted me and my challenge was nothing but a glaring anachronism. Despite all the skillfulness of my letter and explaining and concealing the anachronism, but thank God, to this day, I tearfully thank the Almighty I didn't send the letter. It makes my blood run cold when I recall what might have happened had I sent it. Then suddenly, suddenly I took my revenge in the simplest, most incredible, incredibly ingenious way. All of a sudden, the most brilliant idea dawned on me. Sometimes on holidays, I used to knock around the Nevsky Prospect, strolling down the sunny side between 3 and 4 o'clock, I mean to say. I didn't stroll at all there, rather I suffered innumerable torments, humiliations, and attacks of spleen, but most probably that was necessary. I darted along between passers, passerbys in the ugliest manner, like a minnow, constantly making way for generals, horse guard officers, or hussars, or genteel ladies. At those moments I had sharp shooting pains in my heart and a burning sensation down my back at the very thought of the sorry state of my outfit and of the wretchedness and vulgarity of my small darting figure. This was the most excruciating agony, an uninterrupted, intolerable humiliation brought about by the thought which turned into the most palpable and unvarying feeling that I was a fly in the eyes of those society people, a revolting, obscene fly, more intelligent, noble, nobler than anybody else, than anyone else, that goes without saying, but a fly nonetheless, always giving in to others, humiliated by everyone and insulted by everyone. Why well, I had brought this torment on myself, which I had to go to Nevsky Prospect, don't know, but I was simply drawn there at every opportunity. At that time, I was already beginning to experience surges of those pleasures of which I had already spoken in my first chapter. After that incident with the officer, I was drawn to Nevsky Prospect more strongly than ever. It was there that I met him most often, there that I feasted my eyes on him. He too used to go there, mostly on holidays, although he would step aside for generals and other high-ranking personages, and also dart personages, and also dart between them like a minnow. Nobody Nobody's like me, and even those just a cut above me were trampled on. He would bear right down on them as if there were simply empty space before him and 
under no circumstances would he give away. Looking at him, I reveled in my own anger and bitterly made my way for him every time. It tormented me to think that not even in the street could I be on anything like an equal footing with him. Why is it invari invariably to you? Why is it invariably you who are first to make way? I kept questioning myself in a mad fit of rage. Temporary. Sometimes waking up at two o'clock in the morning. Why is it always you and not him? There can't be a law about it. Surely it's not written down anywhere. Why shouldn't there be a little give and take? As if normally the case when refined gentlemen meet in the street. So he steps back halfway and you do the same and in that you pass by each other in mutual respect. But that never happened and I was the one who always stepped aside and he didn't even notice that I was giving way. Then the most amazing idea suddenly dawned on me. What if we should meet and I didn't step to one side, deliberately not step aside even if it meant colliding with him? What about that? This daring idea gradually so possessed me that it gave me no peace. I dreamt of it incessantly and horribly and I deliberately went to Nevsky Prospect more often in order to get a clear picture of how I would do it when the time came. I was ecstatic more and more. My plan came to strike me as both practicable and possible, of course. I won't exactly give him a shove, I thought, already mallowing in advance of the idea from sheer joy. I'll simply not make way, bump right into him, not too painfully, but shoulder to shoulder, strictly according to the rules of etiquette. I'll bump into him only as hard as he bumps into me. At last, my mind was completely made up. My mind was completely made up, but the preparations took ages. The first thing I did when I put my plan into action was to make myself more presentable and take a little trouble over my clothes. Just in case, um, just in case there should be a public scandal and then the public is highly refined, the Countess promenades there, Prince D promenades there, the whole of literature promenades there. I have to be dressed decently. That creates a good impression and in certain ways puts one at, at once on an equal footing in the eyes of high society. With this in mind, I asked for my salary in advance and bought myself black gloves and a respectable hat from Churkins. Black gloves struck me as a more impressive and bon ton than the lemon ones that first tempted me. The color's too bright and makes it look as if I want to show off, so I didn't take the lemon ones. Long before this, I had a good shirt ready with, with white bone studs, but the overcoat seriously de delayed, man, uh, delayed matters. In itself, my overcoat wasn't all that bad, and it did keep me warm, but it was wa wadded with a raccoon collar that was, was the height of servility. Whatever the cost, it had to be changed for a beaver one, the kind worn by army officers. To acquire one, I started frequenting the Gosselini Devore, and after several attempts settled on cheap German beaver. Although German beavers show signs of wear in no time and begin to look terribly shabby, when newly bought, they are really quite decent. And after all, I only needed it for the one occasion. I asked the price, but it was still too expensive. After profound deliberation, I decided to sell my raccoon collar. As for the rest of the money, which was a tidy sum for someone like me, I decided to try and borrow it from the Anton Antonik Sedochin, my head of department, a rather withdrawn, but solvent and worthy gentleman who never lent money to anyone but to whom I had been especially recommended when I first started to work by the important personages, personages who had appointed me to the post. I suffered agonies to ask Anton Antinoch for a loan struck me as monstrous and shameful. I even didn't sleep for two or three nights. In general, I slept very little at the time and felt delirious. <clears throat> my heartbeats would become very faint and suddenly my heart would start racing, racing, racing. At first, Anton Antonik was taken aback. Then he frowned, pondered the matter, and in the end, let me the money. In return for a signed receipt, which gave him the right to have the loan repaid out of my salary within a fortnight. <clears throat> so at last, everything was ready. A fine beaver collar rain in place of the filthy raccoon, and gradually I prepared for action. I couldn't come to an immediate decision without first thinking the thing had to be managed skillfully step by step, but I confess that after repeated attempts, I had even begun to despair. We never collide with each other, and that was that either. I wasn't quite ready or determined enough. Once he seemed on the point of colliding, but then I again gave way and he walked on without noticing. I even prayed every time I approached him that God might strengthen my resolve. Once after I had finally made my mind up, it's only ended by my getting in his way, since at the very last moment when I was only a few inches away, my courage failed me. 
He calmly walked right through me and I rolled to one side like a ball. That night I was again feverish and delirious and then suddenly everything came to the happiest possible conclusion. The previous night I had finally decided not to persevere with an enterprise doomed to failure and to abandon it all as a lost cause. With this in mind, I went for a stroll along Nevsky Prospect for the, for the last time just to see how I would abandon it all as hopeless. Suddenly, about three paces from my enemy, I unexpectedly made up my mind, screwed up my eyes, and we collided squarely shoulder to shoulder. I didn't yield one inch, and I passed him on an absolutely equal footing. He didn't even look round and pretended not to have noticed, but he was only pretending of that, I am certain. To this day, I'm quite sure that, of course, I came off the worst, as he wasn't stronger, but that wasn't the point. The point was I had achieved my purpose, upheld my dignity, hadn't yielded an inch, and I put myself on the same social footing as him in public. I went home feeling completely avenged, I was jubilant. I celebrated my triumph and sang Italian arias. Of course, I shan't describe what happened to me uh, three days later. If you read the first chapter of the notes from Underground, you can guess for yourself. The officer was later posted somewhere else. I haven't set eyes on him for 14 years. What's he doing now, my dear old chum? Who's he trampling on now? All right, that was chapter.